hi everyone so today we are going to uh, have this session with uh, two ladies they are joining us from bosnia and herzegovina they are leila and samira samira is from uh, sarajevo in bosnia and herzegovina and works as the regional coordinator of uri multi region she is a peace builder and trying to facilitate dialogue in the faith work and reinforce the importance of living together for the sake of peace and security most of her work nowadays is focused on peace building and creating culture of peace for most of her 10 year long experience in civil society samira has been an educator trying to use the platform of non formal education to raise awareness motivate and empower individuals and groups are reinforcing their role in the change they want to see The work that Samira is doing locally is done through a youth-led, youth-focused, youth-founded organization called Youth for Peace, and she is also part of UNDP's Global Youth Program as one of 16 young people from around the world working towards fulfilling the UN's 2030 agenda. Since 2014, Samira has been a youth leader for the United Religions Initiative. Welcome Samira and I would like to introduce Leila she's a, a psychologist psychotherapist lecturer activist peace builder and volunteer from Bosnia and Herzegovina currently she is doing her phd in psychology at Ankara Ildrim Bayezid University in Turkey please correct me if i uh, pronounce it as wrong so she is also working as a united religions liaison officer For, for the Europe region, and she was URI Youth Ambassador, and she is the co-founder of Youth for Youth for Peace organization, and she is uh, one of the most prominent. It was the it is the youth, one of the most prominent organization in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and she is a non-violent communication trainer. And we had a great opportunity to learn together during uh, PPA Peace Practice Alliance with Euphrates Institute. So welcome Leila to this uh, uh, session. So today we are uh, talking more about Bosnia and Herzegovina. So uh, so war affected country and from 1992 to 1995 um, the there is a kind of uh, ethnic conflict happened in the country. So let's learn more about uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina from uh, Leila and Samira. So I welcome Khadija to open the chat it's good to have you two today uh, miss samira and miss laila we would like to ask you growing up in a war torn country and building person to person bridges for sustaining peace in the post war period it is not easy How do you get involved in this peace process? Should I go first? I was introduced first, so I should. Hello everyone. Um it's the second time today that I have a chance to spend some time with Eco Peace Tea and Cafe team, so I'm I'm really happy my day started with you and it's closing. with all of you guys i'm really happy to be with you and i'm grateful um for such a generous introduction um how i got involved in peace process um i think it came from a point of a frustration of a of a young teenager um as speaking of a teen cafe i was a teenager when i got involved in peace processes i started to volunteer in an ngo called nahla which is a faith inspired organization um doing a large variety of things but um the activity that i actually met layla on was a was a workshop on interfaith dialogue where layla was sort of our mentor so there is a, a lot of interconnection between my story and layla's story um and that's the first time when i actually started to think about interfaith dialogue as such and about peace building i was as a as a student in high school i was engaged in a large variety of of different projects youth empowerment initiatives but i never spoke about peace that much um i live in a country that was unfortunately affected by war i still live in a country that is 
largely affected by the same thing that happened 20 something years ago. Um, and my, my engagement started because I saw things that needed to be changed. Um, it came from a point of frustration and it developed into, um, into a professional uh, dealing with the past and um, initiating dialogue with people coming from different sides. Um, so that's how it started for me. So interfaith has been an internal part of the peace building that I've done since the very beginning. And um, as a teenager, I started. Yeah, so probably I can continue. Greetings of peace, everyone. And once again, thank you very much for inviting us to share these stories of experience with you. And congratulations once again on organizing the series of meetings. I follow majority of them on Facebook and you have some incredible speakers. And I think that young people from all over the world, not just from your team cafe can learn quite a lot. So I felt very happy and privileged and it's honored to be part of this event. I also want to use this opportunity to say happy World Interfaith Harmony Week, even though the week will be almost over, but this is the whole month of celebration. So I'm so happy that you decide to include this as a part of the whole celebration. And as Samira mentioned, thank you very much for this nice introduction. And yeah, there is a lot of overlapping <laughs> in our two stories, but because I'm a little bit older than Samira, I will go a little bit more back in the past and share how it all really started for me. So yeah, Greshma and you other colleagues who organized this webinar, I know that you were asking for some materials to learn more about Bosnia. So probably you are a little bit more now familiar about uh, what is happening in Bosnia and how the war started and everything. But um, unfortunately, I was a very small child and Unfortunately, I was growing up during the war, which wasn't the best experience, and I don't want really anyone to, to experience the same as I. And uh, I was at the beginning in Sarajevo, which is the capital city of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which was under the siege uh, that started in 1992, and it was one of the longest uh, siege in history of almost modern Europe. Uh, but I was lucky enough that I left the country when within, on one of the last, last buses uh, to reach the Mostar, which is the south, which is the country, which is the city in the south part of the country. Uh, why Mostar is very famous for, and you can maybe Google it as well and see some pictures. Uh, it has incredible, the old bridge, which is an amazing stone monument from the 16th century uh, that is built during the Ottoman Empire. And it is one of the most beautiful cities in the Bosnia and Herzegovina, if I may say, and maybe other colleagues will agree or disagree with that. Uh, but also it is a city unfortunately famous because it was divided during the war between two sides. On one side, they were Bosniaks who are mainly Muslims, and on another, they were Croats who are mainly Catholics. And I was a very small child when war was happening over there and a lot of terrible things happened. I was hiding in different kinds of shelters, losing close family members, watching my friends and colleagues dying in front of my eyes. And when war was over, I started going to the school, but because city was divided on two parts, I never really had a chance uh, to meet anyone from other part of the city because it was huge segregation. There were two schools, two hospitals, uh, two universities, everything was doubled. Even though it is quite small city, especially in terms of India, it's like less than 100,000 people. So you imagine it's like a very small <laughs> uh, area. But then I had opportunity and I, but I was always curious to find out who are those from the other side, because I was to teach in the school and also from my peers and family members that those are our enemies who did so terrible things to us during the war. And I was wondering who they are, why they did that to us. And I was really, I had huge desire to meet them, but unfortunately I didn't have chance because when you are living in a divided city, it's very hard to go to another side. And when I started going to the secondary school, I was lucky enough in that sense that I went to the experimental secondary school called Two Schools Under One Roof, which was project of European Union. Idea of the project was incredible. Uh, realization of the project not so much because what they did, they have one building in the central part of the city near this border who divided the city and they bring students from both sides of the city together. But we were just physically there together. We were on one floor, our colleagues who are Croats and Catholics were another one. We have breaks in separate times. They were police officers in the school because they were afraid that conflict would start. And even though I was going to that school, I didn't really have chance to meet people from another side. But then we started the student council 
And then this is the first time when I meet people from other side of the city. And then we start a discussion and I realized, wow, they are the same as me. I was a teenager at that time. They were listening to the same music. They were having the same celebrity crushes. They, were have, they had the same problems with the mods and different subjects. And then we figure out that we are pretty much the same. And we didn't discuss about division at all. But I asked them, did you have a chance to cross this old bridge? Because it's the monument, it's a beautiful bridge. It was unfortunately destroyed during the war, but rebuilt later on following it. And it was on one part of the city, on the Bosniaks part of the city, where are majority of Muslims living. And majority of them say, no, like we never cross this border. We just go to the school and go back to our part. And I said to them, do you want to cross the bridge? Do you want to see? Because there were tourists coming, for example, from India, United States, different places of the world. And they said, we would like to do so, but we are afraid that something terrible will happen to us over there because they were growing up in fear and in these all these stereotypes and prejudice of our people from other side. And I told them, can we organize the program so that we can all go and visit the bridge? And honestly, I was thinking that it will be short term activity that we will do it in a few days, but it took me a year to convince peers from other parts of the city just to come together and to go in another part of the city just to cross the bridge. And it was before the summer holiday, it was really nice hot day and we were crossing the bridge together and there were so many tourists around who were probably thinking, oh, like this is the bunch of the young teenagers enjoying their time together. But for us, it was life-changing experience because not that we just cross the bridge, but we really cross all and we overcome a lot of these stereotypes and tragedies and we, build bridges between ourselves, not just between ourselves as young people, but also between our hearts and minds. And we learned so much during that process. And that was life-changing experience that changed me quite a lot as a young person. And from that day, when I met peers from other side of the city, we come together, we exchange a lot of information and we decide that we really want to build peace in our society, that we want to build, to become the peace builders. And from that point on, I never look back. And then there were just different organizations coming, different opportunities. But this bridge will always stay as a reminder that we all should start building bridges. And that is the most important thing from start from yourself, overcoming your stereotypes and tragedies and uh, meeting people from other side. Yeah, so I just wanted to share the story. I know that it was a little bit longer, but I needed to give you the context how it all started and maybe it can be interesting or another side inspiring for some of those who are listening and who are maybe in a similar situation because unfortunately there is a lot of divided places all over the world nowadays. Thank you Lila. it was uh, so moving uh, to hear and so inspiring to hear the story uh, that you shared and uh, hi Zamira, uh, it's nice to meet you again. Uh, so uh, the question that uh, I want to ask you is that uh, Bosnia is a country where there are a lot of ethnic groups and uh, these people have a lot of stereotypes and divisions among them. So how will we be able to break these stereotypes and uh, reach the message of peace to them? Um, that question is great. It sounds super simple, but um, speaking from a context of a post-conflict country, um, it is hard for me to give a, a, a simple answer, but I'll, I'll give my best. I strongly believe in starting very early and developing age appropriate content for, for children, teenagers, young adults, adults, and targeting each of these groups um, with content that is appropriate for them when it comes to breaking stereotypes and prejudice. I think that a lot of the issues related to stereotypes and prejudice do come from families um, and general lack of education when it comes to peace, peace building, um, the, the breaking of these barriers that we have among us um, do come from either family or educational system. So I strongly believe that we need to start very early. Um, of course, not speaking to children about war because that, that tend to be too much and it is too much. My mother did not speak to me about war per se, but she did teach me um, where it's like tolerance. And she spoke to me about tolerance or acceptance of um, people of different ethnical backgrounds who came back to Sarajevo after war it was over. And I was wondering, why did my friend leave Sarajevo? And I came with that question to my mom and I had quite a workshop with her, even though I was not aware that that's how 
like how I'm going to do similar things in the future. But she had a wonderful conversation with me trying to explain that people were displaced from all sides involved in conflict and that that was the story of her family, but that now she's back and she needs support to be to readapt to the to the community in which they lived before. Um, I lived in Sarajevo. My my sort of story is slightly different than Layla's. Um, I don't remember war. I was born on February 10th, 1994, so very close to the end of the war. Um, but despite the fact that I have no vivid memories of the war, because of my surroundings, I was raised with certain stereotypes and prejudice and certain fear, which is the worst thing that a child could grow up having. Um, and I think that I was blessed to have that kind of upbringing that enabled me to have um, a, a good quality, critical sort of thinking process behind it. Um, and non-formal education was a, was a great way to, to, to deal with stereotypes and prejudice um, and try to sort of deconstruct some of the phenomena around us and some of the understandings and beliefs um, and dialogue is not a means for me. Dialogue is a must. So it's not just people coming together if they want. I think that we don't have the luxury to say no to dialogue when it comes to any issue, whether it's stereotypes and prejudice, whether it's lack of tolerance, whether it's conflict prevention or, or conflict transformation. I think that dialogue is key and um, it's a great, uh, beginning, it's a great middle, and it's a great end part to fight against discrimination, stereotypes, and prejudice that we might have. Um, one thing that's really, that has helped me on my personal journey um, has been the fact that I needed to uh, settle my own demons, so to say, inside before I was able to become a peace builder. It's not an easy thing to do, and, and often I hear that what we do is wonderful, and what we do is so inspiring, but I rarely got a question directed at me or any of my colleagues. How does it feel to do what you do? How does it feel to be in a room with a war vet veteran who was on the other side of the story? How does it feel to know that you have close friends or life partners who suffered the same loss as you have? And, um, Dialogue has been incredibly helpful for me um, and working with experienced peace builders who gave me certain skills and um, knowledge to be able to settle myself first and then become who I am right now, working on peace building initiatives around the country and through my URI work globally. Um, and one experience that has really helped me um, is volunteering with Youth for Peace, which is actually a cooperation circle of URI, um, one of two cooperation circles or three cooperation circles in, in Bosnia. Um, the first time when I got a chance to speak about some of the traumas that I suffered during the war was because of the sort of comfort that I felt surrounded by colleagues coming from different backgrounds ethnical, religious, national backgrounds. And that has been a life-changing experience for me because um, it was never easy for me to communicate some of these things. But I understood that if I wanted other people to be vulnerable in the process of peace building, because you have to be vulnerable, you're not speaking about the weather, you're speaking about trauma, you're speaking about like all of these very heavy loaded things. I understood that I needed to be vulnerable first with myself and then to be able to move on. Um, and it, it was truly life-changing. Um, and I, I'm really happy with, um, with the process that we went through as a team. And um, you guys who are working on, these, on, on this particular project as a team, there is just um, something special that happens um, like after all, like all the initiative is over when you, when it's just a team and the conversations that you're able to start and the peace building that happens in the group is something that gave me most, most effect. But to wrap up this very confusing response, 
I think we need to start early and engaging formal and non-formal education at the same time and working on all layers of society, despite the, the, the age that you have. If you are a grandmother or a grandfather, you, you do need certain skills. Um, if you are a mother, a young mother, young father, you still do need certain skills in order to be able to, to push the society towards peace. And if you are a young person, a very young person, even younger than a teenager, you do need certain skills. So I think that we need to that we need to be very inclusive and very we need to we need to practice something that I call radical inclusivity. So anyone who wants to be a part of the conversation needs to be able to be a part of the conversation, which means that we need to meet people where they are. And what um, EcoPeace um, Teen Cafe will be doing with Spanish language as an example of that. Layla, do you want to share? Yeah, maybe I can just add a few things because I completely agree with Samira. And as we said, we share so many experience. So I really don't want to repeat too much myself because I know that there's probably some other question coming. But I completely agree that education is one of the most important thing because on my own example, you can see that if I was having the opportunity to meet somebody in early age, I will not develop so many stereotypes and prejudices, and I will not be in a position to start doing this peace building process by myself if education system was providing it to me. And as Samira mentioned, definitely start really from the early age and also start to the different levels because in Bosnia, these peace building processes were happening through different organizations and they were targeting the political system, education and others. But I think that the biggest changes are happening on the grassroots level. And I think that URI community and all of us who are doing can see that really those small, what we call small, but those are, I think, the biggest people, the small ordinary people are really doing extraordinary work. And if you start from your local community and start from yourself, I think that the biggest change can be done in that way. And uh, in this process of peace building, what I learned in my own example, tackling stereotypes and prejudice in a process that needs to start within you. And if you manage to overcome it by yourself, then everything else will be much easier. But if you are coming into process trying to convince others that they need to change, then you are completely on the wrong way. You need to be in peace with yourself in order to bring peace to people around you. And as I said, I think starting from the early age, starting in local communities, involving different actors, but I think that the biggest change are happening in local communities because you know the need of people around you, you know the need about your neighbors and you make the biggest change over there and you can inspire other people. And also just by meeting others will help me the most. And what I learn is it's great to organize different activities and to come together in workshop and to discuss about what happened during the war. But really going in those communities, meeting those people and trying to learn their part of the story is much more important because when you meet other human being, then your connection is completely on a different level. You are not seeing them as somebody over there who did something to you, but you see them as vulnerable human beings with their positive and negative sides that you have as well. And then you can meet, you can find some middle ground which will help both of you to overcome stereotypes and prejudice and to move forward and also to be aware that there yeah there is some absolute truth in the end but they can be also a different perception and different truths and different sides and there is nothing wrong if you are not agreeing about certain things it's most important the process and the peace that you will bring to your own community so yeah i strongly believe if meeting another human beings uh, meeting there in their context and trying to do things in your local community that you know the best is probably one of the most efficient way how to overcome stereotypes and tragedies and bring peace to the community. Yeah. Um, thanks, uh, Leila, for sharing that. Uh, like, uh, Leila and Samira is always sharing your story. It's so touchy and it's always a lesson for generations to not forget the past and uh, living uh, with mind of forgiveness to other ethnic communities and even though we had a like very hard past so um, so that's why i really want to have some positive uh positive experiences even though that uh, like the during the war period so do you remember any any moment that which uh which you find or you saw some peace heroes during the war period. Maybe Samira can share some of your memories of your parents that they shared about a story that 
other uh, eth- people who belong to other ethnic community may give you a support or protection or maybe a shelter during the war period maybe leila can share about your own experience so yeah this question when you shared the questions in advance um my brother came to me it's not like an inter-ethnic story but it's a story about a child he was born in 1988 so he was about four or five when the war started um and just the habit that he had and the conditions that he witnessed so he got um he got like a few cars like toys um in a, a humanitarian aid package as a kid and so he was rejoiced that he got new toys but a few minutes after that my mom saw him and he took a hammer and he crushed all of the toys that he got and my mom started like screaming like what did you do and he was like well this is what cars look like don't they because that's the only car that he saw around him was crushed burned and that's the memory that he wanted to recreate with his toys that's how a normal car looked like to him um and we still joke about that because it's hard to translate that into english but he was a he was a cute child um and the way he spoke about those cars was very profound and he was admiring them for being the shape that they are um telling me a lot of, about the perception of the child and his innocence and how he observed everything around him um and to a certain degree how sheltered he was from the fear that other adults and other people around him felt um but an interethnic story would be um so i i lost my father during the war and soon after after that and actually it's um today is the 28th anniversary of his death so it's a it's a special day for my family um a hard one and a special one at the same time um but soon after my father passed away my mom had to move with two young kids as a single mom to a whole different part of the city and just imagine that the city is being bombarded shelled um and you have to move with two kids to another part of the city so she managed so uh, the first hero in my mind is my mom who managed to do all what she did um and then when we moved to the apartment building where i grew up um there was um a man his name was boshko he passed away unfortunately a few years before um i don't know five or six years ago um and he was of another ethnic group um and he was pretty much the the person in charge of that apartment building making sure that everything works as much as it can work during war because there's no water no electricity um and my mom always speaks so highly of him because of the support and the care that he gave her and her kids the two of us when we moved into that apartment building he didn't allow her to pick up anything he wanted to set up everything for her he always like would bring her the first like the aid that would that was coming food and everything he would always bring that first to her and he had a really protective role um for my mom at that period of time um and i have to say that other heroes that come to mind um are almost all women uh because of the way that they managed to uh preserve the family um and make sure that everything looks normal it's insane when when i hear my mom saying that they went to theaters because there was a war theater established or they went dancing because they were trying to find a way to just get out of the stress and fear and all of it and the insane recipes and food that they managed to make out of nothing like um a a, a fish um cans from vietnam war even that came here as like aid they managed to make something with it um and so i think that anyone who goes through a war is a hero in their own regard um and there's so many even funny stories of what people did to each other and how much they laughed and how much I think it's just human psyche trying to survive in such a and Leila is a psychologist so I I always try not to comment on it but the strength of and the power of of the mind and just making sure that that stays intact is that just makes them heroes to me 
anyone who's been through that, that kind of experience. And unfortunately, Bosnia and Herzegovina is not the only country in the world that's been through this. If it was, it would be easier for me to deal with it, but evil is everywhere. And as long as it exists, unfortunately, thing will, things will happen. Um, but as long as we have people who are um, trying to work towards something better or even using the situation to the best of their ability to preserve the family and, and the community, they're heroes for me. And everyone who can walk a straight line up and down after being through that experience must be a superhero, not just a hero. Thanks, Amira, for like uh, that much touching. Like after every question, it's been like uh, we we are with you, like and we were witnessing the uh, war moments with you. And thank you for sharing that. And Leila, please. Yeah, guys, yeah, I'm I'm always impressed when I heard Samira's stories. Even though I heard some of these stories for a few times, but it always brings so many emotions. And I think that people also like her and other young people who managed to survive everything and not just managed to survive because she was even born in the end of the war, but who managed to become peace builders after all these experience are inc incredible human beings and heroes. And as she said, I think that almost all, almost all people in Bosnia and Herzegovina who survived war and uh, who remain mentally healthy as much as they possibly can and who decide to really build a better future and who overcome all these stereotypes and tragedies are definitely nowadays heroes, not just in Bosnia and all over the place. But discussing and mentioning some specific examples when Samir was talking and a lot of memories come to my mind from the war because even though I was a few years old, I, I still remember some things that happened because when you have those many traumatic experiences, those are usually the ones who unfortunately stays with you, but also some positive ones as well. And uh, one of the examples that come to my mind is that in some, in some extent, I also consider my father to be the, the hero in that period of time because he was the soldier during the war and he was fighting in order to protect his family and uh, and I want to believe that he did it to the best possible way that he could in that time. But we also have in our neighbors, the Lady Hoover from the other part of the city and there were some circumstances and somehow she ended up in our neighborhood uh, during the war. And she was literally stuck over there and she was threatening for all her life because all, all terrible things were happening. It was a very small city. A lot of people lose their life during the war in that neighbor because of the soldiers from different side. And of course, when you are in a war, you are so mad and you want somehow to revenge for everything that were happening. And unfortunately, she was usually targeted by everyone in the neighborhood, but she, she was our next door neighbor. And my family really took care of her all the time, protecting, she spent so much time in our home as well. And in one day she realized that she will definitely need to leave the place because it was impossible for her to stay over there. But remember, it's in the middle of the war. The city is completely divided, so it's almost impossible to leave the place. But then uh, my father tell her, if you really want to leave, I will make sure that nothing will happen to you. And I'm, I, I was a very small child, so honestly, I don't remember how they managed to do it. And I didn't go into too many details or my father wasn't really uh, interested, let's say, to, to share what really happened and who knows how he managed to do that. But he managed to help her to leave the, this part of the city safely. And she managed to reunite with her family in another part of the city. And then after she was there, she sent us like the gifts because, you know, as Samira mentioned in the war, you really don't have anything. So she sent like the full box of sweets and food and toys for me. And I was, of course, the happiest child at that period of time. And we still remind the friends and yeah, I'm, I'm so happy that my parents even managed to continue this kind of friendship and that they build this relationship, even though all these terrible things were happening. And another story is even before that, as I mentioned at the beginning, I was in Sarajevo at the beginning of war and I was even younger than that period of time. But it was also one lady, uh, she was a similar example as Samira mentioned, her neighborhood, uh, he, yeah, her neighbor, this, this uh, gentleman who was helping her mother. This was very uh, old teacher. Uh, and she was uh, Orthodox and she was Serb because Bosnia is divided, as you probably know, to three. I mean, there is three national and religious group living like Mus Muslims, Orthodox Catholics, who are in the national sense Bosniaks, um, 
Croats and Serbs, and she was coming from the Serb background, and Sarajevo was under the siege because of all this Serb army around the city, but she decided to stay, and not just that she decided to stay, but she also tried to provide education for people who stay there, I mean the young children, because she was a retired teacher, and she basically she teach me all the basic things that I that I knew as a child. I mean, I was very small, so I was not in the age that I was able to learn so much, but like the drawing and writing lines or something like that. And I'm, I'm so thankful for having her in, as a neighbor there. And she also stayed there till the end of the war. And uh, yeah, she built very nice relationship with my grandmother and we remain in contact. She died also, unfortunately, a few years ago. But those are the disordinary people that I said who really make the extraordinary things during the war. I think that all of them are amazing heroes. And I'm sure that all over the place you can find those people. Yeah, so those are some stories that I wanted to share with you. Uh, thank you so much. If I, if I just can say two sentences, because unfortunately I will have to leave you. It's so beautiful, but I just don't want to go speechless. Sure, ma'am, sure, please. Thank you, thank you very much. So my name is Amra Pandra, and I'm one of the, uh, uh, the thing I'm most proud on is that I'm one of the 11 women uh, who were uh, um, by the survey of TPO Foundation uh, uh, people said that we, I'm one of the 11 women who built the peace after the war. I was 22 years old when the war started in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and uh, uh, I devoted all my life these 20 years to work as a peace builder. And, uh, I cooperated in some pieces with Uri, and I'm really delighted with think what you do because also religion is my very important motive for the working in peace building, just at the moment I have finished my PhD thesis, uh, which is titled Potential of Religion for Peace Building in Divided Societies. It is nothing special that I want to tell you. I just wanted to hear these two wonderful young women and to tell you that the experience is absolutely something what I totally agree and what I'm living inside. And I'm happy that you people from all, all over the world will have a chance actually to hear them and to hear what real Bosnia-Herzegovina is. Please don't listen to the media, don't listen to our politician. It's really just like wrong, it's false picture of something what we live in our everyday life. But our goal in civil society still stay that we uh, uh, surround them and that we take them down in a way and that our vision of Bosnia-Herzegovina actually start to live. Thank you very much to all of you and whoever need me, uh, uh, my, my uh, uh, contact, Leila has my all contacts. I'm available to, to, to help you in any way. Thank you, thank you Amta for that uh, powerful word. Sure we, uh, sure, we will contact you. And yeah, we, we really want to learn more from you. Thank you, thank you thank so much. Yes, that was incredible. Actually, these stories really need to be heard by the whole world. I really feel that. And special thanks to Samira for being with us today, even though it being a very special day for her. Uh, we are really humbled. <laughs> Thank you so much. And to take uh, to a light note, like I really wanted to know like which is the happiest moment in your peace building journey. I think I'm still. I'm yet to experience the happiest moment. But a lot of the ones that come to me right now that I, I just rejoice in just remembering are related to the, like the participants of different programs that have been going through some of these experiences with us and witnessing their change without us pushing them to change with, it, it's up to them completely. I would say that those memories are one of the happiest ones for me. Um, and it's, um, it's like, it's strange. Peace building, it's like we're building towards peace. So, but on the path of building that whole experience is there is a lot of fear and sorrow and just mixed emotions and, and, and everything. But, um, uh, a happy moment that I experienced and I shared with a friend from a different ethnical group. And this comes to me because of 
today's day um, and, and its importance for my family. Um, the moment that I experienced the, the, the highest level of empathy was um, at a wedding of a friend who, was, uh, who lost her father during the war as well. Um, and she came to me, she grabbed my arms and she told me, I really needed to see you because you're the only one who understands it today. Um, that, and that came to me on my wedding day in September of 2020 when I got married. She was not able to be there. She was pregnant and she was not able to travel because it was the pandemic. Um, but that's sort of that beautiful, sad emotion that I, I experienced. And I met her only because she's a peace builder as well. Um, so that's what comes to me. It might not be the best answer, but either it's the beneficiaries or it's this personal professional moment that I had with a, with a colleague um, of, yeah, I get it. You get it too. Yes, once again, I really need to, to agree with Samira and I really hope that the best moment or something spectacular will happen because we are all striving and doing toward the peace and we hope that every time we'll achieve more and more. But some of the happiest moments were definitely something similar that Samira shared is that on the seminar when you first meet two young people who come there because they were either somehow pushed to be there or they were maybe some kind of accidental meeting, which I will call destiny for sure, that they are sharing the same place together. And then there's always this animosity at the beginning. There are always these young people in the group who come there because of some reason, they're even not sure sometimes why, or, or they come because they would like to start some kind of the conflict they were aiming. And then in the end, when you see that they become so nice friends and that they they, they usually manage to do the most in this group because they really manage to overcome these stereotypes and prejudice. And those are definitely one of the happiest moment or when, when you first time sharing this experience that somebody is going to other parts of the city or visiting other uh, religious group monument, for example, first time entering the synagogue or the mosque of the church, and then they see the beauty of the building, the beauty of the people over there, and they were expecting something that will happen. I'm not sure why, but similar that happened to my friends. They were thinking about crossing the bridge and going to another part of the city will be threatening for their life, but then it's come to be one of the best experiences in their life because all of them become peace builders and they really cross the bridge in that time. So those are some really of the, of the happiest moments and I hope that there will be much more of these kind of moments than the ones that were not usually the best one. Okay. Thank you, Samira, and uh, thank you, Leila. Um, we would like uh, to know how does the United Religions Initiative influence your life in peace building? Oh, <laughs> so URI has been such an important part of my life for years now. Um, I got to know URI through Layla. Again, another connection <laughs> with my life and Layla's life. Um, and I met a dear friend who used to work for URI at the moment and who presented URI in such a way that it sounded interesting from the first moment. Um, and a dimension that I always appreciated about URI is that in Bosnia and Herzegovina, we have these three major religions or ethnical groups or national identities that tend to clash. Just imagine a faith background, religious background, spiritual expression or indigenous tradition. I am sure that in URI, we would be able to find someone somewhere who comes from that very diverse background. And um, for me, URI has always been like diversity on like max. And it helped me so much because coming from this very small country in Southeastern Europe, being surrounded by pretty much the same people always, either it's the three ethnical groups or some, some minorities, um, it broadened my perspective so much. It opened up the world to me without asking anything of me as a, as a very young person. Then the opportunities for networking that I had within the, within the network of URI have been 
um, unique and truly one of a kind. Um, and with our work through Youth for Peace, um, we actually became a cooperation circle of URI before we officially got registered as an NGO. Um, and I think that that journey through URI have, has benefited us so much and the opportunities that URI gave to us as a group of young people to host the, the whole global council of URI and the global staff in Sarajevo in 2017 has been, I think, a groundbreaking thing in URI. Um, give the, uh, the whole logistical structure, give everything in hands of these 10, 15 young people who did, who did everything. Um, so URI has intertwined itself into the finest pores of my life, I feel. A lot of my friends are related to URI somehow. A lot of my mentors are coming from URI. A lot of my understandings and shift in my perspective happened because of URI, because of this exposure that I had through URI. Um, and I think that that's the biggest benefit that I could have um, gotten from anyone. I didn't ask for that. Like when, I, when we joined URI, I didn't even expect the journey to be like this. Like I never knew that one day we're, we will host URI in Sarajevo and that I will work for URI. God forbid, I never even thought of that. It, it looked so far away and it's so, it was so distant. But now it's been two years since I started to work for URI and I, I love my job. Um, and now changing this perspective from being a youth leader, um, a CC member, and then becoming a staff member gives me a, a special kind of perspective on URI because I know what it looks like just to be a Corporation Circle member. And I think that it equipped me with a lot of um, empathy and compassion and just like skills to be able to deal with Corporation Circles because guess what? I am a Corporation Circle member as well. Guess what? I needed to figure out this crazy universe of URI just like everyone else. Um, so URI has enriched my life in so many different ways. Um, and I never thought it would be this way, but that's how URI impacted my life, mostly through broadening my perspective and introducing me to people that I honestly did not, did not know existed at all. And I'm very, I'm very honest about it. I, I did not know a lot of these things, exposure to, um, native uh, American cultures or indigenous cultures from, from, um, South America. In Bosnia, you don't get an opportunity to be, to be introduced to, to, to these cultures um, and indigenous traditions. And so just that like alone is, is an impact enough. Yes, in, in my case also, like you arrived, play one of the most important roles in, in my peace building journey because I'm part of the URI for almost nine years now. I also started as youth leader, as youth ambassador and the forum Youth for PCC. And then I also become the staff and very similar journey to the Samira ones. And uh, URI helped me a lot because when I start my journey, there were a lot of organizations in Bosnia, but they were mainly trying to impose uh, their ideas for example, from European Union or United States, depending where they are coming from and telling what uh, what should you do? How should you behave? How should you build a peace? How should you bring people together? And I'm, I've always didn't feel very comfortable in this kind of situation because of how you can come from other parts of the world and tell me who survived the war and who had so many traumatic experiences and prejudice and stereotypes, still, what should I do? I know the best my context. I know the best my people. I know what is the best over there. And I was always trying to find an organization who will not impose anything, any of their ideas, but just truly support. And then you I come there and I was like, finally, I found an organization who is really supporting without asking anything. They are just supporting, they are there, they are providing you network, they are providing their help and support, but always putting you at the first place and telling you, yes, we believe that the grassroots people knows the best. You know your own context. And also the organization that were empowering so many young leaders, because 
I was very young in, in the beginning of secondary school when I started my peace building journey. And then when somebody come in that age and tell you, yes, you can do whatever you want. And one of the biggest interfaith grassroots organization in the world is standing behind you. It's something impressive. And you are coming from some small country and small city who survived the conflict. So it opened completely new world for me and this networking, funding opportunities, support. And as Samira said, it's opened completely new world. Meeting people from all over the world, I mean, without URI or Peace Practice Alliance program, I probably never met Greshma. And, uh, and I'm so happy that I know her and, and more other amazing people from all over the world and that I learn about so many traditions. And also when I was starting my peace building journey, honestly, I was thinking, okay, this is a very unique situation, what was happening in Bosnia, and I'm struggling a lot. But then through you and I, I figure out that unfortunately, all over the place, there are similar contexts, similar problems, people struggling a lot, and then you can learn a lot from their experience. So if I may use this opportunity, I really would like to invite everyone to consider joining URI or at least exploring what URI have to offer, because if you would like really to be the change that you want to see, then URI is the best place to get inspiration and some unconditional support from the people over there and definitely where your dreams can come true because they are just there to support and help you without questioning anything. And they are also very welcoming people. And I think that URI is definitely the best place, even if you are like 15, 20 years old, or even if you have 70 or 80 and you would like to still do something in your life. So I think that URI is always there and that you and there's always right time to join the URI for sure. Uh, thanks, uh, Leila, for that. And it's like when you talk about URI, I also feel the same. Like I, I also started my journey with URI like early in uh, like 2009. Uh, and I think when I read your bios, I also mm, found that you also started the same year. So, I, so and in 2021 when we met and even during the pandemic we are like very close and we are like having discussions and i still remember samira helping me uh, during like my uh, my hardest time in my life with she's like the covid at the high and i couldn't like i i don't know i didn't know how to move forward and then there's an online community of URI is there for me to help and support. And that was like incredible. And we, we don't get it from anywhere else. So URI is something that it's not just an organization, but it's a kind of, uh, like as Samira described, it's a kind of universe of people who understand and who is there to support others. So I, I really want to share that uh, like I really want to share my experience with you, right? And I'm so inspired by all of you, and and that what makes me motivated to do peace building and come to this field. And even though like we always say that in Kerala, like we are like more peaceful and we live in religious harmony. And even most of the people always ask me like, then why you join for a peace studies course and why you study peace? How can you study peace? So. They are the questions that I always face in my life. So this is the reason that I really hear these stories of pain and trauma. And then I can find the positive side in it. That as Leila mentioned, as Samira mentioned, we can always see people who is real heroes, who survive the war. And when peace building comes, we are building peace and we are building bridges to uh, to create more peace in the world and create harmony among, and there is no difference in humans. So yeah, that's the uh, place where you are. I is trying to create, and we all young people are creating. And Eco Peace Cafe is also an example, and it's also inspired by you are. I and like uh, Dr. Abraham and Maria Atali, and they all mentored us like through youth ambassadorship program. And we are trying to give the same message to other teenagers surrounding us and giving more inspiration to them. So I think we are all, we are the real bridges. We are bridging that the message of one generation to another. So yes, if we talk about you are I like we lost ourselves and we keep on talking. So I, I um, I'm stopping here and I'm giving floor to Daniel. He really wants to ask. 
then it is yeah like uh, vishnu said that uh, your journey has been incredible both of you samira and leela we got up how you found the uh, the demons by yourself and uh, the long journey and how you are a uh, influence your life and all it, it's been really inspirational for me as well because uh, uh, it helps me to know more about this organization although i know from vishnu's experience and all but uh, hearing from both of you it was really amazing uh, so uh, the question that i want to ask you is that uh, since uh, you have been working in uri for so long uh, what is the uh, relevance or role of religion in reconciliation mm that's good one okay so i think that religion has an incredible capacity to bring people together when used for the right causes unfortunately around the world we can see that religion is being misused very often for different political purposes or um just like to to spread the divide among people um but i think that when we take the ownership of our own faith and when we decide that our faith will not be misused in name of any injustice because our faiths teach us justice fairness kindness compassion um when we take these values and we bring them into any space no matter what space it is we cannot do any harm and when you have people coming from very diverse traditions expressions faiths who bring these same values to the table despite the fact that they're coming from different parts they're they're coming from different inspirations when there comes when it comes to their faith these values are things that keep them together and you are i is a testimony of that so in you are i you can be an atheist an agnostic but you still have certain values belief systems behind you how the universe works according to you or what's what are your ethical and moral principles that you follow but as long as we follow these principles and these values um we can involve our religious and faith expressions into the peace building process i think that religion and religious leaders and people of faith have an have a special kind of responsibility when it comes to maintaining peace because i i'm a i'm a muslim i'm a practicing muslim and um my faith teaches me that i have been sent to this earth right now at this particular moment in time to be an ambassador of god's will and every muslim around the world believes that god made us his representatives on earth each human being and i take that role seriously I do not dare to misuse the trust and life that was given to me to create any any harm whether it's uh bribing someone or whether it's cheating on someone whether it's causing harm or um in any way any kind of harm I take my relationship with God very seriously and my relationship with God pushes me in the direction of cooperation There are verses in in the holy book Quran that I follow that tell me to have conversations with the others and meet them. My faith is not teaching teaching me exclusivity. No way. And if I am to follow the prophet's example, peace be upon him, I need to be fair and just. If I am not fair and just, I'm not of his kind. And I take that very seriously. I don't dare play games with god in whom i believe and i think that um that m- my faith pushes me in the direction of the work that i'm doing right now and any good deed that i do um is counted somewhere and empathy compassion a smile is a is a good deed and so all of these interpretations of different aspects of faith um tell me that 
faith has a crucial role in peace building processes wherever we might be. Um, but at the same time, we need to hold people accountable who misuse faith in which, which we follow. Because there is unfortunately a lot, of, a lot of friction created around the world because of misuse of religion. But it is our task not to allow that our faith, our religion, our um, world perception is taken uh, into an interpretation that it is not. Because I am an ambassador of my own faith. It's not Al Qaeda, it's not ISIL, it's, it's not any of these groups. It is an imam who feeds a cat. It is um, 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 an older woman that helps her other uh, people in the village where she lives. It's me, a, 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 a young person from Bosnia Herzegovina who is doing the work because I understand that any justice that I bring to this world is counted and any injustice that I bring to this world is encountered. And that's not a small thing to, to know and to understand. That's amazing, uh, Samira. Leila, do you have something to share? Yeah, I just want to say, she really beautifully said, Samira, I completely echo everything that you said. And I think that uh, even though in our country, religion was completely misused during the war, and part of the conflict even started because of the division of different religious groups. I think that it is great and in a peace building process, we focus more on the beauty and positive side that each religion are representing and to respecting other human beings and really to following the, go the golden rule so that we will not harm others or do anything bad to the other person if you would like not to similar things to be done to us. So I think that, as Samira mentioned, we definitely need to focus on positive examples and these beautiful stories that we have in each religion and uh, yeah, figure out that definitely like God or whatever we believe in is one and there are just different paths how we can reach it. And I think that it is great that we have this diversity and beauty that we can learn from each other. And URI is bringing this perspective bringing everyone together toward the same goal of justice, peace, and healing. And that is what all religions are about. So I just wanted to, to give this small addition to everything that was really beautifully said, with, said with, on behalf of Samira. So I don't want just to repeat myself. Thank you. Thanks, Leila. And we are already at eight. So I, um, but I really want to ask one more question. So if you are okay with that, we can go. So, so as we talk about the history of Bosnia, and we are curious to know the current situation, and also, also, um, how can we teach our next generation to live, um, live in, uh, live, uh, learn to live in uh, together with diversities and respecting others. So, yeah, how can we share the message of peace and teach them to live in? As for the first part of the question, the current situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina is a little bit tense. The cycle of violence doesn't stop just because you proclaimed that it's over. And I think that um, every time when, when we're getting close to the elections, the war rhetorics is coming back. A lot of these very negative narratives are sort of resurfacing. And so it's it's always hard to live in Bosnia at this particular time, especially if you're a peace builder, you just feel like lost. Where am I supposed to go? Um, I am I am trying to be optimistic always when it comes to Bosnia and Serena. And, I, and I'm hopeful that one day we will look at the past as a great lesson and we will be mentioning it only as a lesson rather than something that needs to be glorified and repeated again which is the current situation. Um, and the second part of the question was um, for the future generations, how we want to live, right? For them to live in diversity and acceptance. Um, I think that we need to start practicing interpersonal peace first and the PPA uh, program that Leila Greshma and myself were a part of had, a, had this great, vision of how things need to be structured in our peace building lives. So first it's the 
um, interpersonal peace, like what happens inside and dealing with your own self and everything that is there, accepting your own diversities and your different like dimensions of your identity because you're not just a single sheet of paper. Then going to interpersonal peace and making sure that with the closest people around you, you create a peaceful environment full of respect, understanding, acceptance, um, not just tolerance. Tolerance means that you exist and I tolerate that you exist. We need to move, surpass tolerance in the future, um, move towards coexistence and acceptance of people. Um, and then to go globally, um, we need to make sure that the movement that we're a part of whether it's URI, whether it's another network that the people who are listening to us on Facebook right now might be a part of, doesn't matter. Wherever you are, you're good where you are. You don't have to be a part of every single network around the world, but wherever you are, make sure you make an impact. No matter how much we believe that there's so many peace builders around the world and there's so many people who want to do good, the same number or even more are the people who are either not interested or people who want to do harm. We, we should never neglect the fact that it's not only people who want to do good. We need to make sure that we invite to, to, the, to the good side of history, um, those who, who have not been engaged or who not, who not had the opportunity to be engaged. Bringing one people, like what one person at a time into this wonderful circle um, is a great way to start. And, and your team is an example of that. Um, and I just think that we need to share the responsibility of the state in which we live. It is not all the politicians' fault. It's not all the religious leaders' fault. Sometimes it is our own fault because we, were, we ignored the signs around us. And history is written, I don't know, 100 years or 50 years after something happens. I think that everyone needs to bear in mind that history will remember them somehow. And there is only being on the right side or the wrong side. Pick and choose whatever you want. Yes, unfortunately, I, I must agree about the question of Bosnia and Herzegovina, even though I'm currently spending most of my time in Turkey, still there's a lot of tensions happening and uh, yeah, they were announcing maybe new conflict or war that will, that may happen over there, which I hope and pray that it will not come to, to that end. But what is now the problem in Bosnia is that uh, people in Bosnia or those who were trying to build a peace, they were just focusing on, okay, let's stop the conflict and peace will come. But as you all know, peace is much more than just not being in a conflict. And I think that what all of us as a peace builders need to focus on is on building positive peace, building sustainable peace, building something much more than just absence of the conflict. And I think that it is the problem in a lot of parts of the world where conflict starts, but division and issues and stereotypes and tragedies among people stay. And what is also another problem in Bosnia that I see and that I'm as a psychologist focusing right now on is this transgenerational transmission of trauma. You have old generations like our grandparents and parents who survived the war and they have their trauma and their experiences who are now they are imposing to the younger generation. So we need to focus more on this, how to stop this circle of transforming trauma because with the trauma there is a lot of stereotypes, tragedies and other issues are also transmitted and how to transmit it more resilience, more positive values, how to be aware of what is happening. And I still think that this is applicable to a lot of parts of the world and different families that are in those younger children and, and teenagers that are growing up after the conflict. And I think that we need to be aware of it and that this peace building process should be also include this intergenerational aspect where older people who actively took part in the conflict and younger ones born after the conflict should sit together in the same table and learn from experience of older ones and younger ones because honestly what I survived and what I remember during the war I don't know I don't want my child to go to the same experience either anyone else because it's so terrible and there's nothing nothing beautiful in any conflict and war peace is much more appealing and I think that we all should strive to the peace 
and those are some, let's say, of the tools that, that uh, I try at least to work on. I think that there is a huge role of younger generation. And I think that peace building should be on agenda of everyone. And as, Sarima, as uh, Samira said, we definitely need to start from ourselves. And what I see as uh, and, and get as a question a lot of time is like, oh, you are in a peace process so long and not so many things change. And don't you think that all these things that you are doing doesn't make a lot of sense or they are so small in the context of this big world and politician and this complicated political and social situation. But I said, I managed to change to some extent myself. I see changes in my community. I see people crossing those bridges. I see that situation is much better than it was 20 years ago when we were still in Bosnia and Herzegovina. So I see that it is paying off and I want to do all of these things because I don't want future generation to see the same. And, and I want to send a message to all of you younger people who are watching and being part of this beautiful thing cafe is that there is no small things. Every small things are making big change in the end. So whatever you do, start from yourself, start from your neighbors. As Samira said, smile to another person, help somebody cross the street, help somebody find peace within themselves, do whatever is in your power and you will be the, the change maker and you can do so much. Even though if you are not in a position of helping anyone else in your certain earnings, you can still work on yourself and you can use this media to share the positive news, to join other, to join bigger community, to spread the love, spread the peace, because I think that peace is definitely the only solution and that the peace is the, the goal that we should all strive on. So yeah, thank you for giving space and thank you for all your incredible work that you are doing because you are setting example for the younger generation, what can be done. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Samira and Leila. It's so like I I really don't get in words to explain how I feel right now. It's so powerful, and we like to end this call with a with hope that we all pray for Bosnia and Herzegovina, and we hope um, peace prevail there, and there will be like lots of happiness, and children will learn together under one roof and they lay together and they they would have the same syllabus and yeah we hope for that day and thank you so much for joining today and this uh, make this discussion more fruitful and on facebook there are like lots of viewers and lots of comments are going on so thank you so much for those who are watching on facebook and please make small changes in your life that can create big impact so thank you once again and if samira and laila if you like to share maybe on one word or one sentence please do and after that you can i would like to thank all of you for being so brilliant and awesome and for doing the work that you do without anyone forcing you to do it or being made to do any of it i am incredibly proud um, of, of all of us together who are managing to bring about a change uh, and no change is ever small. And let's not burden ourselves with changing the world today. It's not gonna happen. Let's try to find a way to be productive and useful to our whole community and to ourselves through through the positive things that we can do every single day and no, nothing is too small nothing that we do is too small thank you you were you were incredible i i really loved this conversation thank you thanks amira thank you also from my side i'm i'm very inspired by everything that you are doing and i'm so happy to meet all of these amazing people and i'm so happy about and proud about what the kreshma is doing and um, thank you once again for invitation and samira said really and as i highlighted earlier there are no small things whatever you do is counting and it's so important and there is always right time to do the right things and i just want to invite all of us on this call and everyone who is watching us on facebook start now from this moment think now what you can do in the next hour or two in the next day and start now and whatever you can do it will then build up into something bigger and i think that we are generation who need to stop the circle of violence and that I think that we can build definitely the peace that this world needs. And thank you, Greshma, for incredible work and for all of you bringing inspiration for younger people in your communities. And I'm really looking forward to see you all again on some other meeting and to see fruits of our work.
Thank you. Thank you so much.